review. Let's review the Club Kid uh, edition. Isn't every episode no, of you a Club is a, Kid this edition? Is a, this, is a, this is an all Club Kids all the time edition. Everything Club Kid related. You know, it's funny because the viewers or the viewers are very are a very contradictory lot. Oh, because yeah. some of them are com complain that we're always talking about the past and why are you talking about the past again and can't you talk about the present? And then others will complain, it's like, well, why are you always talking about these parties we don't care about? Why don't you talk yeah. about like the A and but B it's always been that club way. kids of the past and it's, what are they doing now? We want to know about them. It's always been that way, even in the past. <laughs> and the, the thing is, though, the past and the, and the future or the present are often intertwined. And they, one, well, they are. One leads into the other, and it's nice to give a, a background information from something that's happening now. You get, you get a little bit of a background. All right, so we and were... And everything old is new again, as we are about to see. Yeah, we were very amused by the uh, James Valoria Club Kit cards that the store put out. Um, I think they're great. During Fashion Week. It's, it's, Earlier this month, I thought they were originally an homage, but Ernie, as Ernie pointed out, they are a pastiche. I mean, I guess you could say they're either a pastiche or an homage. I right? think they're a pastiche because they're an updated version of something that happened months before. Yes, so they I noticed that the the the, 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 the Disco Two Thousand. Uh, I we should show an old Disco Two Thousand. Well, we'll show one on the screen. Right, we'll flash one on the screen. But if if you recall, in the original, it's still the same shape of the uh, Club Kid card. And what they did is they took out the Disco 2000 logo and they took out Clara the Carefree Chicken. Right. And but they put eyes up there, like sort of chickeny eyes. Right, so they kind of blanked it out and then put their uh, their little thing there. And uh, But essentially it's the same card. Yeah. And um, I understand that these people who are in the cards are people that work at James Valoria. Now James Valoria is a store in uh, based in Brooklyn and I believe they have a, a shop in um, on 75 East Broadway in Manhattan. Now, you know, this, it's interesting because this is not the only um, pastiche to the those Club Kid trading cards. Um, Drew um, Drew King made a prototype set of new um, Club Kid cards for Outrage, which I actually have, which we'll put those on the screen too. And they're also similar to this. Um, so we'll put those up there too. All right. The, uh they're iconic, actually. I mean, I remember last early, either either earlier this year or last year, the New York Times had a whole full page oh, yeah, that's of the Club Kid cards on in their style that section. That was when they were made into wallpaper and used as not wallpaper but wallpaper, and put up at the what was the name of the restaurant? June. It's June. the Chinese restaurant where the limelight used to be. Right, June Lan. But that's not what the article was about. No, the article was about that book uh, about right. nightclub invitations or night. Right. You know, that actually had nothing to do with the club kids. Nothing to do with the club kids. <laughs> Not one, I don't think there was one in video. It was a book of, supposedly, of all the great parties of, you know, the 80s. No, 80s. there was, there were a couple of club kid invites in there because I know there's one invite that has my name on, in, on it in that book. Which one is it? I don't remember what, which one it was, but I remember seeing my name in the book. There are not, there, there are no great parties of ours in there. Um, but. The, uh, but the image they use is this wallpaper, this great wallpaper that, that caused a furor, if you remember, um, between uh, somebody and somebody, <laughs> between the person who took the pictures and the person who made the wallpaper. And um, who did not have permission to use and the I, pictures. And there's, you know what, there's not really, it's, it's one of those things where they're, they're both right and they're both wrong. Um, I just wish they would both get along and, and, and kind of just... I mean, I would say that the person that appropriated the photos is wrong because they knew who made those photos, and you know, you don't lose photographers don't lose rights to their images. You know, and I ever. don't, I can't, I can't remember what the person who put the photographs together, what his argument was. Um, but I, I do remember he had an argument, and it was, it was an argument that was at worst, at least worth, at least worth listening to. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it wasn't just some like made up argument. It was a, it, it seemed to make sense. Um, well, I I think the argument was I took those pictures. I own the rights. You can't sell them. To no, the people. other person. Oh, the other person who sold it. Yes. So, um, and I think his argument was something, and I can't remember. But I think it was something along the lines of, um, I the, I took those pictures. I, we bought them, and I you per, turned them into a piece of art, and now that piece of art is mine. Mm -hmm. Something like that, I yeah. think. But anyway. Um, um, it's great wallpaper and uh, and stuff. That was the time. That was the, the, the 
furthering the scandal was um, the fact that they took my name out of the wallpaper because everybody's names are un underneath their pictures and um, they were going to take my card out completely but they thought that taking the card out would have only drawn more attention. Like, where's my good card? So they just took out my last name and it just said Michael. I guess that was a compromise. All right, well, we're going to take a break. And now a word from our sponsor. City in the late 80s and early 90s and who took many of the iconic photos of the club kids that uh, some of you might recognize from the club kid cards from the various uh, Disco 2000 invitations. He also took a lot of photographs that appeared in Project X. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're, they're really great with the, the full page. Those are my favorite uh, uh, renditions of the club kids at the time. Right? I believe he shot photos for Pansy Bee, uh, yep. which was a queer uh, magazine that was published in the East Village by Michael Economy. Uh, he, his photographs appeared in many magazines. And uh, what I think is singular about his work, well, first of all, the reason we're talking about it is because his exhibition, Nightbirds, is opening at the Stonewall National Museum in Wilton Manors, Florida, which is in Fort Lauderdale, on October 18th. And it's going to be on exhibition for three months until January 20th, I believe. So anybody who is- Where is it? In, at the Stonewall National Museum in Wilton Manors. It opens on October In what city, though? Wilton Manors. Oh, is that the city? Yeah, it's a oh. city next to Fort Lauderdale. Oh, Wilton Manors sounds like a... It sounds like a soap opera. Or something yeah. Like, yeah. Or something, yeah. <laughs> Days of our lives at Wilton, Wilton Manors. Wilton Manor. Yeah, it sounds like Thurston Howell yeah. III lived there. Uh, so anyway, it's a, um, a little city next to Fort Lauderdale. and. Um, the exhibit's going to be up for three months, so it's planned and during the winter when a lot of people are likely to be in Florida. So I really encourage a lot of you to go there. You're going to see iconic photographs that he took of many of the club kids, and not only just the club kids, but he also took a lot of photographs of the drag queens that were active at that time, you know, and a lot of the go-go boys who because were they got so much. Those photos got so much airplay because at the time he was really one of the one of few. Photographers, and I'm, I'm not talking about paparazzi photographers. No, we're talking about studio shots. Right. So it's, I don't think anybody has his collect. Yeah, he was not the type of photographer who was out in the club shooting no. with a really good camera. He was taking portraits and the like that's staged, staged portraits. You know, and I don't think that anybody else really it's a has completely the different art form. It's like it is. Well, it's portraits. Yeah. And nobody has this. Nobody, nobody has that that the, the white variety. Of and um, so because of that, his photographs are, he's almost the go-to guy for those, you know, whatever a magazine wants to need something like that. They go to him, and so his photographs are the ones that are, they get, like, all of this airplane, so that, so they become, like, these iconic looks. But they're, they're, they're kind of looking to begin with, and since there are so many of them, he's, they're even more. Yeah, I mean, it's hundreds of them. So, I mean, he sent me some of the contact sheets of the boards that he created for the show, and it looks spectacular. Yeah. I'm actually gonna be there, the opening reception is on October 18th, so if any of you live in Miami or Fort Lauderdale and wanna come meet me, you should come to the Stonewall National Museum. I'll be there for the reception, I think it's at 7 p.m. And uh, it'll be a meet and greet. And uh, he has asked me to loan the museum three or four of my costumes. I sent them four, I don't know how, if they're gonna use all four, but they're going to. Which ones are they? Um, they're like unitards and jumpers, but there are at least four portraits of his in which either I or you or other people are wearing the uh, costumes that I designed, and I still have those costumes in a big suitcase at mm -hmm. home. So when I told him that, he asked me to send him some of them. They're going to put them on mannequins next to the portraits. Yeah. So it's going to be multimedia. Uh, oh. It's really cool, so I'm really excited about it. That's not, that's not exciting. I um, think it's going to get a lot of publicity. We've been talking about doing something like that for a long time. So it's, it's, it, well, he really wants to do it in New York City, and his hope is that now that a, a museum is doing it, like museums are just like everybody else, that 
like they might not be interested in something until somebody until else somebody is doing else, it. Yeah. And once somebody else is doing it, they see how fabulous it is. Then they're like, oh yeah, we want that too. So his goal is that once it's done in Florida, that exhibition will travel to different like and probably, LGBTQ. See, that's probably why he wants to start in a place like New York because it's, once it's in New York, it's easier to like sell it to others. No, but the thing is that you so, could go the other way too. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's actually easier to get things in other cities first, and well, then and then it comes to New York, and you know, because like say like a lot of successful Broadway shows, they don't start in New York City. They actually well, but they start in outside of New York City on purpose because they want it. By the time it gets to New York, they want it to be polished. And, uh, well, right. Well, as with this exhibition, yeah, yeah. you know, so like maybe as it travels around the country, it'll become more grandiose and more elaborate and more fabulous. I mean, it already is pretty fabulous just from yeah. the looks of it. But I will report back. I'm actually going to be there, so I'll film some video footage that we can show on the pew. That's it for this I, time. Bye.